Good morning. Today's scripture comes from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have mentioned to many of y'all in passing that I have a degree in music production and recording technology. It's been a big help this past year with all the online worship technology involved. But I knew by the end of my junior year of college that I would not have a career in the field. Astoundingly, one of the main reasons I reached that conclusion is that I am not enough of a perfectionist for studio recording. In the studio, recording engineers have the opportunity and therefore the expectation to make everything sound phenomenal. They pick out the perfect microphones and the perfect cables and the perfect plugins and the perfect recording method, and they place the mics just right with all the instruments and the voices, and they listen for every little mistake in the performance and keep recording new takes until they can create a perfect recording. But the reason I stuck with that degree program long enough to actually get the degree is not studio recording. It's live sound. Perhaps my favorite thing I did in college was assisting two upperclassmen in running the sound for a musical. The thing I love about live sound is that it's not about getting things perfect. You set everything up as well as you can, and then you adapt on the fly when things go wrong. During that musical, the one night we managed to keep everything working for the first hour of the show, we tripped a breaker and had to completely stop the show for five minutes, bring the lights up in the theater while the stage manager ripped us a new one and we reset everything. But the thing about live sound is you can't go back and do another take. The audience is there listening with you right then and whatever happens is gonna happen, and you have to roll with it. Where a studio engineer might say, let's try another take. A live sound engineer will take a deep breath and say, okay, I can work with this. The story of Noah's Ark and the sign of the rainbow remind me of these two very different audio engineering worlds. The story begins with God deciding this whole creation thing has gone all wrong and going back and trying a new take. <laughs> Think about when in the Bible the whole world is covered with water. It happens twice. There's this story, and before now there is Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 when God's Spirit hovers over the waters before we even hear the words, let there be light. So the flood is a total reset of creation. God doesn't actually go through and recreate everything. It's all on the ark or still there underwater, but this is still a fresh start. This is God taking another shot at creating a perfect world. 
Now, there's an exception to this. God brings Noah and his family along. And everything on the ark and everything under the water has already been part of a sinful world. Sure, Noah and his family were righteous, especially compared to their peers, but they're still human. And we know from the chapters that follow this one, they are plenty sinful themselves. So even as this whole flood happens, God knows it's only a matter of time before the humans mess everything up again. But while the flood covers the earth, God decides to switch from studio engineering over to live sound. Seeing how the flood had to destroy everything in order to allow this fresh start, God decides never to use this solution ever again. The sign of the rainbow is not a promise that natural disasters won't happen. We know that all too well, especially in weeks like this where we watch the news and pray for friends and family and strangers who have lost power and are trying to stay safe and warm and fed in a cold winter. And God certainly doesn't promise that our sinful actions won't have consequences. I think we've all lived long enough to know that as well. The promise God makes with the sign of the rainbow is much bigger than that. This covenant means that no matter what course creation takes, no matter how elaborately we humans find new ways to mess things up, God will always keep redeeming us, never give up and start over. God looks at the world just as it is and says, yeah, I can work with this. Do you know what this means for the whole of creation? The new heaven and the new earth in Revelation are a redeemed version of this same heaven and earth. Like Jesus' resurrected body bears the scars of crucifixion, perhaps the redeemed creation will bear the scars of all that's been done to it throughout human history. And yet, when God looks at all our deforestation and air pollution and oil spills and careless littering and disrespect for the animals that live in the rapidly disappearing untouched wilderness of the world, God sees all the ways that we have throughout the years neglected creation care and says, okay, I can work with this. And through methods great and small, with local trash cleanup days and big international environmental agreements and everything in between, every so often we can catch a glimpse of God at work redeeming the whole of creation over and over again. And by the grace of God, we whose lives are built on things that only exist because others before us didn't care for creation, have the chance to join God in that redemptive work. And think about what this rainbow promise means for the human community. We are so polarized and so divided right now, especially in our own country in so many ways, and yet God sees us at war with one another in our actions and our words, at interpersonal one-on-one -on -one levels and in global conflicts. And God says, yeah, I can work with this. And through the hands and feet of those created in God's image, through private personal apologies and overarching policy changes, that honor human dignity, God keeps on redeeming humankind. God doesn't pick out the good people and ditch the bad ones. God sees all the people, all of us together, whether we like each other or not. And God decides every single day to keep on redeeming us. 
Now consider what this promise of redemption and not destruction means for the church. It's probably the reason there is still a church. We have messed up plenty in the past two millennia. And we have done so in ways that tarnish God's name as well as our own. There are people today who will not give Christian faith a chance because of our long history of persecuting those who disagree with us, even including other Christians. We don't always live in a way that would back up our claims about God's grace. We get too into our own self-preservation and we start worrying more about money and buildings and the legacy of our names than we do about showing others the good news of Jesus Christ. Building or no, budget or no, official institution or no. Don't get me wrong, buildings and finances and being part of an organized religion are not bad things, of course. But we are constantly tempted to idolize them. And nothing can be more important to us as the church as the body of Christ in the world, than bringing the gospel where it is most needed. God sees those hidden church politics at work that made me want to run far away from the church when I was growing up as a preacher's kid. God sees all the good the church does, and God sees us at our very best, but we have to remember God also sees the worst of who the church can be. And even so, God looks at the holy mess that is the church universal and at each of our little local churches with all our gifts and graces and all our sins. And God says, all right, I can work with this. And somehow, even in the times of the Crusades and the years when the church upheld slavery in America and days even now when we're just not acting a lot like Jesus, even when our motivations are imperfect and our plans are half-baked and our best ideas stay on the drawing table, God works miracles. And the church is over and over again the outward and visible sign of God's transformative, redemptive work in us, in humanity, and in all of creation. The church is not made up of the best people, not by a long shot. But by God's grace, we are a people that God chooses to keep on redeeming. And even though we can probably think of others who might seem more qualified on their own merit, we are a sign of God's hope that the world is being redeemed. The church is a living rainbow in our world today. And here we are, three very different churches that happen to be in the same community. We have a history together. Some of it's beautiful, but it's not all good. But that's the story of creation. And God has determined that this messed up creation is one that can and should be redeemed. God sees us trying to figure out life together and God says, sweet, I can definitely work with this. This week we are beginning the season of Lent. This is a time of penitence, of changing our hearts and lives in order to become more fully the people that God created us to be. If you are taking on a spiritual practice or giving up an indulgence or an addiction during this time, chances are you won't do so perfectly. I confess I already messed up on my Lenten practice a couple times between Wednesday and today. But you know what? God can work with that. God chooses and promises and loves to work with imperfect people through every setback. So take heart. God is with us through it all. Amen.